Welcome to DIA Today, Democracy in America Today. I'm Matt Parks alongside Dave Corbin. Glad to have you with us as we explore the ideas behind today's headlines. So last day in Texas, huh, Dave? Last day, I know. It's uh, amazing the summer's uh, flown by. Uh, we've uh, had a great time, uh, met our neighbors this week. Well, we've met our neighbors before that, but uh, had a barbecue and uh, really enjoyed uh, this last week. Um, but California, on to California tomorrow through uh, Arizona. We'll stop at Tucson and, and hopefully arrive in Pasadena Sunday evening. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's gone by too quickly, but it'll be good to get back to work and, um, and to see colleagues and soon see students. It all starts up two weeks from tomorrow. So how about yourself? How are things? We're doing pretty well. Yeah, we've got about one more week before the kids get back to homeschool. We're not starting at King's for a while yet, but we will be doing some school around here. So that's starting to be a dawning reality. We've we've survived a week of 90 plus degrees, all air conditioning all the time, realities that follow from that. So it's supposed to cool off a little bit. Looking forward to that. We've got a a run of birthdays that begins in August. So the kids are updating their wish lists and, and getting all that kind of thing ready, making the plans. As kids do. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Our, our kids like to plan their birthday dinner about six months out. So okay. when, you, when you get within a month or two, if, you're, if your Amazon wish list isn't up to date, you start to feel a little bit nervous. It's crisis so, time. Yeah. Yeah. I've got to make sure you've got things prioritized just so. Well, our last show, we focused on the return of sports, which was a a glimmer of hope amidst the troubles of our day. Although, if you're a baseball fan, it's been a little challenging start to the season. I think we've got six or eight teams that are currently sidelined. But today, we're back to politics, and we're going to look at the topic of authoritarianism and the rule of law through the lens of one of the big stories of the last week, the ongoing standoff in Portland that pits the Trump administration against the governor of Oregon and the mayor of Portland, federal agents against anarchists, anarchists against Black Lives Matter protesters, and perhaps most importantly, partisan hyperbole against the truth. So let's start with some headlines. Uh, Writing for ABC News this morning, Bill Hutchinson gave a nice summary of the situation in Portland. A good read if you're looking for something to catch yourself up on what's been going on. But basically, as of Wednesday night, 62 consecutive days of protests, and they continued. It was significant that night because there had been an agreement earlier in the day announced between the governor and Vice President Pence to have state and local law enforcement officials take over the defense of the federal courthouse and the adjacent federal property, which is kind of in the center of all the activity for the last month, at least to take over that defense and to allow those federal agents that had been sent there by the Trump administration to return home. But having announced that agreement, uh, the acting secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, and also President Trump, both reiterated that that would only happen uh, once those buildings were secure. So to take a little bit of a step back, this latter phase of these protests began around 4th of July weekend. And it's interesting if you go back and you read the stories written at that time, not stories today looking back on that time, which have the lens of all the the partisan things that have happened since. But you actually go back and read the accounts from those days of what was happening on the ground before the federal agents arrived. Interesting report from the Oregon Public Broadcasting site that begins this way. This is published on July 4th, but talking about events from the 2nd and the 3rd. Police broke up a group of several hundred protesters in downtown Portland overnight Thursday and into Friday morning. Crowd control munitions were used after protesters shot fireworks towards police, broke windows, and set what appeared to be a small fire inside the federal courthouse, police said. And on Friday afternoon, so that would be July 3rd, Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler called for an end to the protests that have turned violent. Now, it was the next day, as Reuters reported last week, that Department of Homeland Security began deploying the federal agents, including members of its rapid deployment force, in a mission that's been uh, codenamed Operation Diligent Valor. And altogether, there's been 114 federal law enforcement personnel that have been sent to Portland. So that's, that's kind of the background 
And what's striking, and we're going to get into next, is the political reaction of all this. So let's start with a few comments on the left. Here's Ryan Cooper uh, at The Week in a piece entitled, Why Trump's Invasion of Portland is Textbook Fascism. Kind of gives away the argument right there in the title, but here's, here's how he presents the events that we've just summarized. As of early July, the Black Lives Matter protests in Portland had dwindled to a relative handful of people, some of whom had done some vandalism here and there, mainly in and around the federal courthouse downtown. Locals report that many Portlanders had begun getting rather tired of the protests, viewing them as more self-indulgent than something with an identifiable goal. But then Trump sent in his paramilitary goons, dressed like Call of Duty cosplayers without identifying markings, who started grabbing people off the street and stuffing them into unmarked vehicles. The protests were instantly revitalized. The vandalism was at worst a minor nuisance and a great many ordinary Portlanders were outraged at the sight of a paramilitary gang kidnapping people over the objections of the city's mayor, the governor of Oregon, and most of the state's congressional representatives. Thousands of people poured in, including the now famous moms dressed in yellow. CBP thugs naturally responded with extreme violence, spraying chemical weapons willy-nilly, beating a 53-year-old Navy veteran with a club and breaking his hand in two places, and shooting a man in the head with an impact weapon that fractured his skull. One of the moms reported that on July 25th, while merely standing near the courthouse, she also was shot in the head with a rubber bullet, opening a deep gash between her eyes that took seven stitches to close. There is no actual mass unrest in the city. And insofar as there has been any unrest at all, CBP paramilitaries are primarily responsible for instigating it and have committed virtually all of the actual violence. This cannot possibly be an accident. And that's the setup to the analysis of how this is ultimately a, a fascist play by, by President Trump. Now, at the same time, you've got other articles and the same kind of argument made by Zach Beauchamp and his Vox explainer, who argues that in essence, the Republican Party has been taken over by the same authoritarian impulse, is at least willing to go along with Trump's authoritarian desires. He concludes uh, this section of the piece, his unprecedented deployment of federal law enforcement personnel is a means to that end. He gets away with it because American politics is so dangerously polarized that Republicans are willing to accept virtually anything if it's done to Democrats. I'd ask the following question to begin an anal analysis, and that is, you know, was a federal government being attacked? And if the answer to that question is yes, then the next question is, well, does the president of the United States have a responsibility to defend federal buildings across the country? Well, I, I think that, that he does, uh, especially if local authorities aren't uh, protect, uh, protecting those buildings within their jurisdiction. Sending in federal agents to defend federal property doesn't strike me as authoritarian. It strikes me as the president fulfilling his responsibility to keep uh, federal operations um, alive and well um, in those places, especially if those are places where justice is being administered. But what am I, what am I understanding incorrectly there in that assessment, Matt? Well, I'm not sure you're misunderstanding anything. Now, there were a number of concerns that were raised in the first piece that I read about specific incidents. But what's interesting is that the Department of Justice Inspector General has actually opened an investigation to determine whether excessive force has been used by federal agents in Portland. So it's a very interesting development when you think about the argument that authoritarianism is really, if it's anything, it's unlawful, unaccountable power, a power without any semblance of law behind it or any restraints around it. The fact that the Department of Justice itself is investigating some of these complaints and incidents right, is, is encouraging. And, and obviously, if those incidents turn out to be as described in that piece, or even something like what was described in that piece, then there ought to be accountability for that. And there are instruments in place for that, uh, including, by the way, having the attorney general who heads the Department of Justice come to the House of Representatives and, and testify, as William Barr did uh, earlier in the week. So just to kind of read a little bit of his testimony as he responds to some of these concerns and charges and gives his own accounting of what the federal government is doing in Portland and really tries to address, I think, some of the, the questions that you were just asking, Dave. So here's what he said as part of his opening statement. 
In the wake of George Floyd's death, violent rioters and anarchists have hijacked legitimate protests to wreak senseless havoc and destruction on innocent victims. The current situation in Portland is a telling example. Every night for the past two months, a mob of hundreds of rioters has laid siege to the federal courthouse and other nearby federal property. The rioters arrive equipped for a fight, armed with powerful slingshots, tasers, sledgehammers, saws, knives, rifles, and explosive devices. Inside the courthouse are a relatively small number of federal law enforcement personnel charged with a defensive mission to protect the courthouse, home to Article Three federal judges, from being overrun and destroyed. What unfolds nightly around the courthouse cannot reasonably be called a protest. It is, by any objective measure, an assault on the government of the United States. In recent nights, rioters have barricaded the front door of the courthouse, pried plywood off the windows with crowbars, and thrown commercial-grade fireworks into the building in an apparent attempt to burn it down with federal personnel inside. The rioters have started fires outside the building and then systematically attacked federal law enforcement officers who attempt to put them out. For example, by pelting the officers with rocks, frozen water bottles, cans of food, and balloons filled with fecal matter. A recent video showed a mob enthusiastically beating a deputy U.S. marshal who was trying to protect the courthouse, a property of the United States government funded by this Congress from further destruction. A number of federal officers have been injured, including one severely burned by a mortar-style firework, and three who have suffered serious eye injuries and may be permanently blind. Largely absent from these scenes of destruction, are even superficial attempts by the rioters to connect their actions to George Floyd's death or any legitimate call for reform. Nor could such brazen acts of lawlessness plausibly be justified by a concern that police officers in Minnesota or elsewhere defied the law. So you see the way he sets up the argument. This is a defense of federal property, and there's an obvious disconnect between anything that would be accomplished by what the rioters among the protesters are doing and any legitimate response to the death of George Floyd. And on that last point, interesting further piece from that ABC article that I mentioned earlier, showing some of the dynamic within the groups that are gathering there in Portland. So this is the reporter writing, in recent days as vandalism, attacks on police and fires ignited in the streets have increased, protesters have become split between those bent on destruction and those who believe the peaceful actions of the Black Lives Matter movement are being drowned out by demonstrators and agitators pushing violence as a means to achieving their goals. On Tuesday night, the difference in philosophy played out in the streets of Portland when a white protester dressed in riot gear set a sizable fire in the middle of a street. A Black Lives Matter protester who identified himself to ABC News as Neji ran over and put the blaze out in an incident caught on video. The white protester in full riot gear responded by yelling, light the fire again. A frustrated Neji yelled back, trying to explain that inciting violence and destruction was taken away from the BLM message. The white protester responded, they burned down one police building in Minneapolis and they defunded the police department. So there's the political bottom line. Right? You burn down buildings and you get what you want. It really is amazing when you think about the destruction that's taking place or the hope for destruction, you, you wonder what it would take to open uh, many eyes to, to the problematic nature of, of this violence. I think back to 1995 and that horrific bombing of the Oklahoma City a Federal Building by uh, Tim- Timothy McVeigh and what our rightful response of indignation was to that horrific act of violence. Why isn't that the case now? Is it just that it's just not a mass amount of death? There's not a hundred people that have been blown to pieces by by the actions of of a violent party. And will it take that for the country to wake up uh, to the reality that uh, anarchy is no good uh, for the country? Um, uh, mobs. Um, uh, spreading, you know, violence and, and intimidation uh, is no good for the country. I, I just don't know, Matt. I, I, I don't understand this this willingness to accept these tactics uh, as a legitimate uh, type of um, protest. You know, this lack of proportion that's causing trouble on on both sides as we try to understand the broader story of what's going on here. On the one hand, you've got the deploying of 114 federal agents to defend a courthouse in Portland. And that's authoritarianism. That's fascism on its way to America. 114 agents defending a courthouse in one city. 
Um, but then on the other hand, you know, you've got President Trump sometimes and others around him talking about universal anarchy, right? As if the whole city of Portland or the whole state of Oregon or whatever is all being given over to this. So, you know, there's just an unwillingness for people to address problems in the context in which they actually exist and, and, and an unwillingness to speak in, in proportionate terms to the situation. Right? It's, it's right to identify the anarchy and the anarchists as a problem that needs to be responded to. And it's right to respond to that in a way that secures federal property. But it's unnecessary to turn this into something bigger than it actually is on either direction. Right? And I think that's, you know, everyone's kind of looking for that moment where they can prove their thesis, right? That America is going this way, irretrievably lost in this direction, or irretrievably lost in that direction. I've been saying all along that if we had four years of Trump, this is how we we're going to end up. If we had four years of Antifa out there in Portland, this is where we're going to, everyone wants to be right. And they're looking to be able to lay claim to being right the moment some incident happens that if multiplied 10,000 fold would actually be the thing that they predicted rather than having some sense of proportion and ability to evaluate these events in, in their proper context, uh, which doesn't require that we ignore in either direction, whatever concerns there might be, but, but we can turn the temperature down just a little bit and if there's anything that's central to the purpose of this, of this podcast, that's what it is, right? To, to get some perspective on, on headlines that, that require this urgent response from us all the time. So let's, let's turn to our required readings and get some of that perspective. Great. So I have three pieces that I'm going to assign for required reading for today. The first was a, a book um, from a study uh, written in, in 1950. The most famous author of the book was a man named Dorno, and it was titled The Authoritarian Personality. Uh, the second assignment is a, an essay by Hannah Arendt, who we've referenced other times on this podcast, titled What is Authority? An essay she wrote in 1954, three years after uh, her uh, famous work on totalitarianism. And then the third work is an essay written by Pierre Manent titled The Return of Political Philosophy, an essay uh, that was part of a speech that he gave in, in 1999. So I think what we're going to try to do, Matt, with the required reading is try to dig deeper into uh, what authoritarianism is, uh, how it uh, differs, if it differs at all, uh, from totalitarianism, from uh, fascism, from tyranny. Uh, these are, are terms that are often kind of flown around, um, pasted upon people uh, with the idea that um, you can simply call someone uh, something without understanding what the term means. And this is, in, in fact, um, a little bit of what I think was taking place uh, with this controversial 1950 study. The study was, uh, was commissioned uh, because of uh, the awful history of the 1940s, uh, the rise of fascism uh, in Nazi Germany, uh, the anti-Semitism that went uh, along with it. And the question that the individuals who put on the study asked is, is there an authoritarian personality that we can identify? Uh, are there certain um, habits of that authoritarian personality that you can quantify? And if so, um, can, we, can we figure out uh, who the authoritarians are, um, how they're created, and, and, and hopefully um, be able to undermine the recreation of this authoritarian mindset from one generation uh, to the next. So interestingly enough, when um, the researchers took a look at what they believed was central to the authoritarian uh, personality, they very much uh, look to uh, the efforts in, in particular of Sigmund Freud and his model of psychoanalysis to get to the heart of what's going on with, with this authoritarian personality. And what suggested by the authors in the study uh, following uh, Freud's analysis of human nature. Uh, Freud, of course, um, defines human nature as tripartite. It's made up of three parts, uh, not reason uh, and will and passion as of the ancients, but the superego, the ego, and the id. The superego, of course, is that societal or cultural or civilizational consciousness that impresses itself upon the human being. Uh, 
uh, the ego is that level of individual consciousness that we possess, and that id is the inner drive, um, the primordial aspect of, of who we are as human beings. And the question of, of who we are individually and as a society has much to do with the different amount of power that each of these parts of our self uh, possesses. So the authors of the study um, suggested the following about what they call the authoritarian personality. At the core of the authoritarian personality is a great sense of personal insecurity. It's a person who is um, uh, insecure in many ways. They're not happy about their own self. Um, and what they do is they turn to a civilizational authority or cultural authority like Hitler, uh, and they embrace that authority, that superego, and that embracing of that superego uh, really satisfies their id uh, by uh, demeaning other human beings. In this case, um, this would have been the, the Jews with, with Hitler. So you find a group that your civilizational power can attack uh, and kill and defeat, and that at the end of the day satisfies um, your insecurity or makes you more secure. Uh, the authors of this study, of course, believe that in 1950s America, there was uh, abounded this type of, of human being uh, who um, could easily fall prey uh, to fascism uh, or authoritarianism. It was really hit upon not only the type of leader that would produce this among a flock, uh, but many in the American people who, um, who for one reason or another, were insecure uh, about their, their way of life. Now, it's not hard to kind of move from that assessment of 1950s America that is drawn from this study and that employment of Freud and his psychoanalysis to see parallels between how we, we understand the other, our, our political opponents. Uh, so, for example, um, after uh, President Trump was elected in the fall of, of 2016, Sure enough, this notion of the authoritarian personality made its way into many an article that was assessing how could Donald Trump ever be elected by the American people? And the argument went something like this. You know, the American people are insecure. They were looking to a leader uh, like Donald Trump who would uh, point to the immigrant uh, or point to the minority, or point um, to the foreigner, uh, and demean or talk in a demeaning language about that individual, and thus in doing so uh, would satisfy that, that eternal uh, in, uh, drive um, within each of these Americans in flyover country uh, that would then make them secure. So what do you, what do you make of, of this notion um, coming from this study in 1950, Matt? And, and do you see it as something problematic when you take in, into account the scope of, of all politics? Well, I mean, if you go back to the context of the study, this is 1950s, early conservative response to communism and the totalitarianism that arose around that. And, you know, we're talking about McCarthy. Um, and so you know, there, there was a lot of the academic left that was looking suspiciously at the emerging conservative movement and saying, oh, that, that's really a proto-fascist kind of movement. And, you know, that was an easy case to make if, if you had a certain construct like the one that you're talking about that you could simply apply and, and project onto individuals. And, of course, in the same way, right, the, the, the conservative movement of 2020 or 2016 um, can easily be labeled individuals can easily be fit into this construct so that you can what what's the ultimate goal well to say these this 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 is a discredited and discreditable movement and therefore ironically it frees you up for just the kind of you might say authoritarian response to that group that, that you're accusing that group of being willing to use against its own opponents, right? One of the ways in which we use these kind of labels, whether it's fascist or authoritarian or whatever, is, is not just to describe a present reality or to anticipate a threat, a legitimate threat, but in particular to 
define certain people as being out of bounds, right? This is how you have your deplorables or whatever the label might be that you don't have to listen to. Once you define somebody as beyond the political boundaries, then yeah, you can fire their supporters. You can dox them. You can try to cause all kinds of trouble for them. And, and so that's why exploring the actual criteria that define these movements is such important work. And it's particularly troubling when social scientists and those who have a responsibility to speak responsibly on these matters use these tools in a way that lend themselves to partisan agendas. Yeah, which was a, a big problem, by the way, with this study, because, of course, not only do you see the rise of, of fascism in the first half of the 20th century in its ugliest form in, in Nazi Germany, but you also see the rise of communism. You, know, you have uh, your Lenins and your Stalins in the world, and there was no application of the authoritarian thesis to men and women on the left. Uh, it was simply... Um, a, a charge made to a certain type of right-wing personality. And I think, you know, it'd be interesting, right, uh, to, uh, if, the, if the theory has anything to it, to apply that theory across the political spectrum. You could say very much that there's a certain uh, personality prone to an adoption of Marxism that might fit into your uh, Freudian psychoanalytic model. Or never mind, um, uh, Tocqueville describes a soft despotism in democracy in America. Is that soft despotism a democratic personality type that, that is prey uh, to authoritarianism. But uh, these social science researchers were not interested in doing that in 1950. I think much like, you know, many a journalist uh, or an opinion uh, leader uh, who floats uh, this, this, this title, this tag, is not interested in getting into the question of, of what the thing is and whether or not the thing uh, adequately uh, applies uh, to this individual or this group of, of people who are followers. Uh, anyway, I want, I'll move on uh, to, um, to my second required reading, which I, I think uh, does a lot of this kind of um, differentiating between uh, different types of um, a political behavior that is is problematic. Uh, I mentioned that Hannah Arendt had written the Origins of Totalitarianism in 1951, and in a later essay, uh, What is Authority, written in, in 1954, uh, she interestingly takes a look at the differences between authoritarianism and totalitarianism, and and makes an argument that there's a relationship between the growth of modern totalitarianism and the disappearance of legitimate authority. So she writes the following at the beginning of her essay. It is my contention that authority has vanished from the modern world. Since we can no longer fall back upon authentic and undisputable experiences common to all, the very term has become clouded by its controversy and confusion. Little about its nature appears self-evident or even comprehensible to everybody. So here Arendt says something very interesting at the beginning of her essay. Authority in and of itself is important to the proper functioning of politics. You might say in the modern world, authority is important to the proper functioning of politics, as is freedom. But if authority gets a bad name, if there can be no common authority present, then this leads to another type of crisis. And, and she says this is a type of crisis that existed uh, within the 20th century. All of these political movements, she writes, that were intent upon replacing the party system and develop the development of a new totalitarian form of government took its place against a background of a more or less general, uh, more or less dramatic breakdown of all traditional authorities. We need authority. But what type of authority do we need to secure ourselves against what she believes is the real danger, which is the prospect that we might embrace totalitarianism? Well, the real type of authority that we need, she argues, stands between force and persuasion. There's a certain type of force that you can employ, right, to get someone to do what you want them to do. That's not what she means by authority. Uh, it's the employment of um, uh, physical means to, to get your way. But authority is not, likewise not defined as persuasion. Uh, it's, it's really kind of a, a reverence paid uh, to an idea or to a way of thinking uh, that has proven itself uh, correctly. 
Uh, and she says that in, in the West, this idea of uh, this particular type of authority that falls between force and persuasion had uh, from the ancients, from Plato and Aristotle, through the Roman Republic and Roman Empire, through the Holy Roman Church, and, and through the Reformation, and finally uh, to the building up of modern society, had become more and more prominent and more and more central to the human experience, uh, particularly in the West. But then what happens at the end of the 19th century, due to the growth of nihilism and, and other uh, relativism and all questioning of whether or not there are absolute truths, this authority is put in, into a defensive position, and finally, uh, it's somewhat removed from the political equation uh, altogether. So she, she says that quite interestingly, what happened, right, is that at the beginning of the modern world in particular, those modern political philosophers that wanted their followers to question the authority of the church, uh, the authority of transcendent truth, believed that if they placed authority within the political realm, within the city of man, uh, that this would be a type of authority that uh, we could abide by, it could structure society, we could practice a modern science of politics uh, where authority was rightly appropriated to representative, et cetera, uh, and the political picture would take care of itself. But what Arendt is arguing here is that that same doubt that's cast upon transcendent authority eventually by the end of the 19th, early 20th century makes its way into a casting of doubt upon um, imminent authorities. Well, you know, to go back where you started talking about power on the one hand, persuasion on the other, and then authority in between. I think we, we, we often talk on this podcast, we often write, teach about the importance of, of persuasion, but we recognize that it's impossible to persuade everybody of every point starting at the very first premise of every argument. This is a point that de Tocqueville makes uh, quite eloquently in the second volume of Democracy in America, where he talks about every, every society has to have a source of authority of some sort. You, you can't individually come up with your own judgments about every question. You have to rely on somebody's judgments. And so if it's not going to be some transcendent authority, and if it's not going to be some, say, politically legitimate group of people that we recognize as, as our superiors in some sense, then who's it going to be? Well, de Tocqueville says in a democratic society, it's going to be the majority. We're skeptical of tradition in democratic societies. We're skeptical of individual claims of authority. We, we trust our own individual judgment, but overwhelmed by all the different decisions we have to make and all the different circumstances we find around us in a very dynamic, modern, democratic society, we look to the majority to supply those opinions that we can't otherwise generate on our own. Yeah, and here it's interesting you mentioned de Tocqueville because I think uh, Arendt very much falls in line with a lot of de Tocqueville's thesis regarding uh, this this um, kind of balancing or the, this need for an alliance uh, between um, the spirit of religion and the spirit of liberty that that one can't properly exist without the support uh, of the other and and Tocqueville's also his, his mentioning of the United States as a uh, peculiarly different um, politi a modern political movement because it's there where Americans, at least originally, uh, are willing to adopt and embrace the idea of a moral dependence upon godly authority or the authority of nature or nature's God. Uh, and, but on the other hand, um, a, a willingness uh, to embrace a desire uh, for liberty, that, that this combination, this hybrid of, of moral dependence and political independence can actually create human flourishing, whereas the tendency in the modern world, especially in, in Europe and the European revolutions that took place, were to be either all in for authority and believing that the proponents of liberty were anarchists, or all in for liberty and believing that any anything that uh, represented tradition uh, needed to be um, uh, removed uh, from, from society. So uh, Arendt argues here that, um, that the liberal and the conservative, or the modern liberal and conservative, they ought to be working with one another to define the proper limits of 
authority and liberty. But instead of working with one another, the danger in the 20th century and 21st century is that the modern liberal and the modern conservative point their guns at each other. And this allows for the creeping in of a totalitarian climate and a totalitarian takeover of both the liberal movement and, and the conservative movement. So I'll, I'll, I'll end by saying this on the piece. One of the great things that she does, most of um, uh, former students kind of know that I really love drawing pictures of squares and circles and triangles and that I'm quite an excellent artist, right? You have an amazing gift. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. What I can do with a stick figure is like like no other professor in the country. And I'm not, I mean, that's not an overestimate of my abilities, but one of the the geometric shapes too. I mean, don't, don't sell yourself short on three-dimensional boxes. I do. I, and I put, I actually, I kind of put them in motion as well. Um, It's, it's, it's amazing. I, I, I can't wait to get back to the classroom and be able to draw on a whiteboard. But uh, <laughs> kidding aside, um, I, I think that um, there's, there's one picture that, that Arendt draws here that I think would be very, very helpful for us just to, to think about you know, moving forward and trying to distinguish between these different types of isms that, that we may not uh, like or, or, or want. She says that um, a lot of the governments that existed up until the modern age were in many ways authoritarian. And if you were to draw a picture, a geometric model of what that authoritarian government looked like, it would be a pyramid. But what held that pyramid back from being something that was dastardly to the people who lived under it was that whoever was at the top of the pyramid pointed to a source of authority outside of that pyramid, pointed to a source of authority that was an absolute truth that must guide that person's action, or at least help to guide that person's action. And this model of authoritarianism, Arendt argues, differs from the geometric model of tyranny where, yeah, you have the pyramid still in place, but the person at the top of it is not pointing to any authority outside of that pyramid. That that person is the final say on any given matter. But here thirdly, and, and interestingly enough, when Arendt draws a geometric model of totalitarianism, she says that the model doesn't look like a pyramid, but it looks rather like an onion, where the authority is the leader who is at the core, hidden from sight from the various layers. The structure of the onion, she writes, in whose center is a kind of empty space the leader is located. Whatever he does, whether he integrates the body politic as in an authoritarian hierarchy or oppresses his subjects like a tyrant, he does it from within and not from without or above. All the extraordinarily manifold parts of the movement, the front organizations, the various professional societies, the party membership, the party bureaucracy, the elite formations and police groups are related in such a way that each forms the facade in one direction and the center in the other. That is, plays the role of normal outside world for one layer and the role of radical extremism for another. The great advantage of this system is that the movement provides for each of its layers, even under conditions of totalitarian rule, the fiction of a normal world along with a consciousness of being different from and more radical than it. This is the reason why Arendt uh, is uh, is most uh, frightened uh, by the prospect of totalitarianism it's a type of authority that's held over you without you being able to figure out who's actually doing X, Y, and Z. You have to, you have to peel off the various layers of the onion uh, to get to what is driving it uh, at its core. So um, she ends her piece by asking whether or not modern liberalism and conservatism are up to the challenge of totalitarianism. Uh, it would take, uh, and I would agree with her here, it would take an education uh, in the building up a proper authority of understanding Plato and Aristotle, understanding Roman civic traditions and their appropriation of the Greeks, of understanding the church fathers and Augustine and all the rest uh, to realize um, how we've fallen into this predicament and what the decline of the West uh, means. But uh, definitely an interesting um, kind of an interesting argument that, you know, in an age where you want to label someone as authoritarian, is, you might want to remember what is good authority and and how does good authority operate within a flourishing uh, political uh, system? Uh, One other thing I'll mention, because I I know this is of interest to you, Matt, um, she references the American founding fathers near the end of her piece as really kind of the quintessential um, 
moderns who understood uh, authority correctly. What, what do they get right about authority that, I, that secures, or at least initially secures us against uh, the formation of totalitarianism uh, in, in this country? I guess I'd say probably two things. Number one, they, they had that ultimate reference point. And so you think about the opening passages of the Declaration of Independence we looked at a few weeks ago and the invocation of the laws of nature and of nature's God and the reference to creator that gives a shape and structure to political life, all of life. Uh, but then also when it came to political authority, they always would wed authority and responsibility. And so you find this, especially in the Federalist, but there's very careful consideration of how do you ensure that wherever people have power, there's responsibility for that power. And so to think about human authorities being subject to all the, the weaknesses of our selfishness and our inherent flaws, needing to be accountable for their authority. And in other words, the opposite of what you're describing with that onion, we should be able to point to this person as having acted in such a way that caused this action. And if that action was wrong, we should be able to have some method of holding that person accountable, whether that's through elections or whether that's through hearings. These are the kinds of structures that you put in place because we recognize that human beings wielding power will do so in ways that advance their own selfish good or the good of, of a cause that's only seeking the partial good, not the whole of justice, unless there are ways of holding them accountable for the right use of that power. And the, the Arendt's uh, uh, geometric uh, description of totalitarianism begs the question, well, what, what's at the core of, of the onion? Uh, is this kind of a, a Marvel Studios movie where there's just some evil presence there from outer space, some alien force that is driving us to do uh, X, Y, and Z? Or, or can we, using political analysis and using an assessment of uh, phenomena of the 20th and 21st century uh, come to grips with with what may be at the core uh, of this onion, which is where I want to turn to in the third thing that I assign uh, for today, and that is uh, the Menenta uh, essay from a speech, uh, The Return of Political Philosophy, where Menenta takes a look at uh, the uh, problems that political philosophy and political philosophers have had in the 20th century trying to come to grips with the phenomena of the 20th century. Uh, and here, Manent highlights uh, the role played by Leo Strauss uh, to, uh, to really understand uh, what was taking place in the 20th century. Uh, much like an Arendt was trying to understand was take, what was taking place in totalitarianism, Strauss also um, uh, was trying to figure out how do we get to Nazi Germany? How do we get to the growth of Soviet communism? What, what happened? And in following Strauss, Manen suggests the following, that we ought to look back to the classical political science of Plato and Aristotle because these classical thinkers understood the regime type that makes itself apparent in the 20th century, and that regime type is the regime of the tyrant. Now, Strauss, um, Manen notes carefully avoids the word totalitarianism uh, when defining a modern tyranny. But Strauss says something different, um, and it, it, it's kind of interesting here. He says that um, the classics, the classical thinkers like Plato and Aristotle, they understood tyranny well, and they even understood uh, that there could be the prospect of a, a modern tyranny. It did not elude their grasp. So Strauss, uh, Menen, argues carefully avoids using the word uh, totalitarianism in his description of what's taking place uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, in, instead, he says that um, really what is happening is, is, is the production of a modern type of tyranny, stress rights, present day tyranny in contradistinction to classical tyranny is based on, number one, the belief in the unlimited progress in the conquest of nature, which is made possible by modern science, and number two, the belief in the popularization or diffusion of philosophic or scientific knowledge. Let me just take a step back real quickly. So the difference between classical tyranny that is lawless and modern tyranny that is lawless is that the modern tyranny that we see in the 20th century was A, driven by the belief that the 
conquest of nature was possible, and B, that knowledge, philosophic and scientific knowledge, could be popularly diffused. So you say to yourself, well, what's the problem with, with either of these things? Why would it be tyrannical to want to conquer nature? And why would it be tyrannical to believe that philosophic or scientific knowledge could be popularized or diffused? So where's the tyranny in modern tyranny? Strauss says the tyranny in modern tyranny lies in its unnatural character. The fact that these two goals would be destructive of humanity. Well, why? Because in trying to attain these goals, much like in Madison's description of, of uh, faction or controlling faction in, in Federalist 10, you would have to take away people's liberty and try to make all people alike to achieve your desired universal homogeneous political community. That's what Strauss believes is driving the modern push forward. That's what I think you would argue is at the center of the onion of modern totalitarianism, uh, this desire to make all people alike, to A, believe they all can be made alike, and B, uh, the desire to do that. And when you take a look at uh, fascism, or you take a look at um, Soviet communism, or you take a look at all of the isms that have defined uh, much of uh, 20th and 21st century um, politics and society, you do see this, this effort to kind of create kind of an ultimate resemblance of all people, to, to, to be able to categorize all human beings as being one kind of human thing. And I think this is, um, this is really a, a danger that we have to be on the lookout for. And it's kind of interesting when you um, come full circle and you talk about Donald Trump and you talk about his followers and you talk about how he was elected and, and all the rest. I mean, you could make the case uh, that, that Trump uh, as a political force uh, is a representation of something that uh, cuts away at that onion or cuts away at the core of that onion or cuts away at that modern tyrannical project. But then again, you know, on the other hand, you'd wonder, like, does, does Trump have any idea uh, of what Arendt or Strauss believed moderns were up against? Well, you mentioned Federalist 10 a few minutes ago, and there in one of the central passages, Madison talks about the fact that we have different opinions, different passions, different interests, and that there's no way around that. That's part of who we are as human beings, and it's actually the job of government to protect the differences in property in particular that result from that, not just differences in amount of property, but type of property. And the point is people pursue different callings in consequence of having different interests and different gifts, et cetera. And so a government that seeks to get rid of those distinctions is on the founder's account acting in a way that's quite contrary to nature. Um, does that mean the government can't look for ways to mitigate the harm that comes to those who, who suffer great deprivation or anything of that sort. No, that's, that's not the problem. But, but the idea, the project of, of making all the same is a deeply unnatural project that, that Madison rejects at the very beginning of Federalist 10 before he moves on to what ultimately turns out to be, as he claims it, a Republican solution to the problem of republics by having a clash of various interests and having mechanisms that channel those interests toward ultimately producing majorities that are in favor of justice and the public good, as he's able to triumphantly announce at the end of Federalist 51. So it's a very different approach, ultimately aiming to achieve justice, now a justice grounded in the genuine nature of who we are as human beings in the actual moral framework we were talking about earlier, a justice that is not uh, based on imagined utopian vision for human life, but actually is, is grounded in who we are as human beings. But that justice can actually be achieved not through forced homogenization, 
but through Republican mechanisms, Republican institutions, and Republican virtues that that surround and uphold those. That's that's the alternative. Does Donald Trump represent that alternative? Not intentionally. <laughs> Not well. Um, I I think that what Trump does do is hold on, hold out the reality of difference. That that this is. One of the things that his supporters, I'd say his more thoughtful supporters, find attractive in Donald Trump, that, that he holds out the prospect of difference and resists those that would homogenize, resists those that would force you to affirm a certain set of approved progressive propositions or the like. But, but he does so in, in such a ham-fisted way as to almost discredit the cause and to make it difficult to claim that the defense of difference is, is something that can be ultimately noble, liberal, Republican, uh, a pathway toward justice. It just seems like being a jerk or being a crank or, or enjoying shocking people for the sake of shocking people. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, Benent uh, kind of ends the essay on on this note. He says that uh, he writes that we need to recapture something of what democracy has left behind in its march. So here he he notes that there's a tendency within democracy to move in the direction of totalitarianism, like like a rent. His modern democracy has successfully asserted and realized the homogeneity of human life but it is now required to try to recover and salvage the intrinsic heterogeneity of human experiences. So on this point with with Trump, Trump would would do much better uh, to, when necessary and when possible, to successfully assert uh, those aspects, those aspirations that we have that any human being has that that might be realized uh, within a democratic age. And I think the more that he did that, along with defending the differences that we have and making the case that we're not all going to be alike uh, and, and that standards can be in place and that they could be applied, uh, the more his presentation would be balanced, I think better received, uh, the more presidential uh, he would be in presenting kind of a, uh, a proper form of democracy uh, to not only his followers, but to the country at large. Well, that's what I have for today. I'm getting bombarded with rain and a storm out there. You may, you may hear this in the background of the recording, but uh, my last day in Texas is an interesting one weather-wise. So. All right. Very good. Well, yeah, you a good thunderstorm. That seems about right for this time yeah. of year in Texas. That's good. Well, speaking of your move, in honor of that, our grade book today, we open the grade book to look at the various time zones. We are gonna grade the time zones. We've got four basic time zones in the United States. I recognize if you're from Alaska or Hawaii, we're maybe leaving you out of this conversation. We're gonna talk about the Pacific time zone, the mountain time zone, the central time zone, and the eastern time zone. Could there be anything more frivolous than than grading time zones? Um, If so, send us a line because we'd like to do that next week. But, But for this week, we're going to talk about the time zones. Dave, you're moving from central time to Pacific time. I know you've really enjoyed having to make those translations for your colleagues on the Pacific coast. And as we've had our back and forth making plans for the show, trying to calculate what time we're actually talking about. That's gone very smoothly. I understand for you this summer. I think on average, I, I, miss or I'm late for one appointment either with you or with uh, people in California uh, not realizing, uh, am I adding? Am I subtracting? So, um, I think of all the time zones, I would I would say the central time zone is the most difficult uh, for me. I'm I, I'm going to give um, the central an F. Um, okay, it's not it's not that I can't do it, but it it's it's pretty much an F when you have two different lives on the east and west coast. It's it's a uh, it's pretty hard to to do. So. Yeah, no, I can see that. The only thing I like the central though is, you know, I'm not a person who stays up late. And so if I could have an hour earlier for my sporting events and, you know, 
evening kinds of things like that, you know, election night, all that, all that, I, I could see the value of that. I, I wouldn't mind having that extra hour there. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'd probably give it a C because you're still having to deal with all the adjustments and there's not enough people in the central time zone. So you're, you're constantly the one that has to figure out how you slide into everybody else's life. But I do like the advantage of, of having that backup of one hour. So if you're watching Monday Night Football, you can actually see some of the second half. True, true. Well, if you like that, then, then Pacific uh, time zone is amazing. I mean, I, I can't imagine how many fewer baseball, football games I would have watched over the last two years had I been on the East Coast just because they, <laughs> they go so late. So watching the Red Sox a couple of years back, you know, win the World Series and it's still 8.30 at night or the Super Bowl's over and, and you know, 7.30 p.m. and you can wake up and actually do something the next day. Uh, that's, that's been uh, a pretty neat aspect of Pacific time zone life, which I, I think I'd give a B plus, A minus too. I, 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 like, I like Pacific time zone. I think, I think it's nice. Yeah, we lived out in Washington State when I was in – middle school and we were out there for the 1984 election and in those days my bedtime was was pretty early but because Ronald Reagan uh, totally destroyed Walter Mondale in that election and because we were out in Washington State I was actually able to watch the election returns coming in and and I remember um, just that overwhelming victory that Reagan won really nothing like it in in the years since but yeah that was that was only because we were out there on the west coast able to watch those election returns and enjoy, enjoy that evening. That was the first, the first election I really remember caring about um, and, and uh, having a, a strong rooting interest for Reagan that time around. It was very satisfying to see him win every state but Minnesota and uh, the three electoral college votes of Washington, D.C. So for those memories' sake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Pacific uh, an A-. minus. All right, so we've got Mountain Time and Eastern Time left. Let's talk about Mountain Time, Dave. I don't know much about Mountain Time. I, uh, I think, what are there, 2 million people who live in Mountain Time in the United States? I don't know. My sister's uh, among them, her husband up there in Boise. Right. I don't want to leave anyone out. I think that it's, if that's you, your Mountain Time, that's Colorado, right? So, uh, yeah, I imagine I, yeah, I'd have the advantages of Pacific just uh, in the – earlier a start and close to games and all the rest. Um, so I'll, I'll give it a B. I, I'm just going to assume it's, it's a good thing uh, going uh, off of uh, my knowledge of Pacific. So a, a B for Mountain. See, what I wonder and I worry about for you is what happens when you've got some reality TV show finale and they show it on the East at 9 o'clock at night. And then, of course, you're all over Facebook every night. And so you're getting all these comments on what happened on Bachelorette. And meanwhile, out there, mountain time, whether it's Pacific, right? I mean, it's total spoilers. Your evening's ruined the whole time you spent building up to the grand finale. And now you know the answer before you even watch the show. You nailed me. I mean, those, those shows, uh, if I'm not watching one of those at night, then uh, it's just not a house, uh, Corbin household event. So yeah, yeah, it's rough. It's um, yeah, my, but, uh, but still, still, I just yeah. turn my phone off and that. And, uh, <laughs> that's, so. that's important. Yeah. yeah. I had to do that a few times for the Super Bowl when we were trying to catch up after, after evening church. So, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to have to degrade the downgrade the, mountain time zone just for those purposes i just wonder if you're gonna have all kinds of trouble keeping up with your reality tv pastime so i think that'd be minus uh, that leaves with the eastern time i know most of our lives have been eastern time lives it's 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 comfortable it's familiar it's 50 percent of the country which has its advantages what, what would you grade eastern time dave now that i've been on the west coast i'd I give it a lower grade okay. I, I think uh i've seen i've seen the light um and it really is the one thing, that, well, not the one thing, because there are many things, but it's one aspect of West Coast living that, that I've uh, adapted to well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give East Coast time a C plus. So not quite as difficult as Central. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think the further West we go, the, the better off we are with time zones. I'm, I'm a convert now. So Okay. I mean, I like the East Coast because we dominate everything. You know, the world has to – 
at least the American world, has to bow to us. And so everything is geared toward that Acela Express corridor uh, that, that we happen to live in, that I happen to live in. So, you know, in that sense, it's, it's convenient. But now I, you know, being, as I said, a person who likes to get to bed a little bit earlier, get up a little bit earlier, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind having a little bit of a different schedule. So I'm going to, I'm going to give Eastern time a B and, you know, be grateful for the advantages that we get out of it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's tough stretching out those late nights sometimes. So Pacific wins, if I understand this correctly, I think it received the highest grade. I from think Pacific most- might've won. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, because Good. you got a lot of people out there. So there's enough, you know, enough heft that life organized around Pacific time can actually work in a way that I think central and mountain it's, it's difficult. There's not enough people. So everyone assumes, you know, you have to make the adjustment rather than people adjusting to you. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, now we know, now we know the answer. What is the best time zone? Apparently it's the Pacific time zone. We're going to close the show as we always do with the Tocqueville's crystal ball. I like to bring in some sports here. Often we do. So this week we've got the NHL beginning this crazy nine day push. We talked about a little bit last week to try to set their final 16 playoff teams. And so what they've got is they've got the best teams in each conference are playing a little kind of round robin tournament among themselves to determine playoff seating. But otherwise the playoffs are actually underway. So teams five through 12 in each conference huddled in either Edmonton or Toronto and playing best of five series in order to decide who makes that final 16 team field. So there'll be a lot of good, a lot of good hockey coming up starting Saturday and, and beyond what we're going to do We are not hockey experts. We have to admit this. What we're going to do, there's eight series, and by the time we have our next show, all those series will have had at least three games out of five. So at that point, we'll know, will there be any sweeps? So that's the challenge this week. How many sweeps will there be, and which teams will accomplish those sweeps? All right, so you've got eight to choose from, Dave. First of all, the question how many sweeps? I'm going to go with zero sweeps. I, I actually think this is going to be fairly competitive. And um, I, think, I think we're going to have, I mean, I would love this too, if we'd have eight five-game series. Can you imagine <laughs> that? Can you imagine eight, eight uh, season-ending uh, games? Wouldn't put it past hockey to pull that off. So. Yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with that. I, I think uh, zero sweeps, uh, and, and hopefully um, we'll see a lot of good competition here. So how about right. you? I- yeah, I think that's very possible. I think it's improbable just because playoff series, uh, even in competitive leagues, there's often a, a sweep or two. I'm going to say two sweeps. I like Pittsburgh to sweep the Canadians. Sorry, Montreal fans out there. And I like Toronto playing at home to sweep the Columbus Blue Jackets. Now, that'll be a little bit of an upset in the sense that Toronto hasn't won a playoff series since 2004. So a lot of years of struggle for Toronto, but just feels like this is a crazy year. Crazy things are happening all through the sports world. So why not? Toronto gets back on the horse. They've got the the one team in the East with the home ice advantage. Toronto, the eight seed, sweeps the nine seed, Columbus Blue Jackets, and off they go. And who knows? Uh, On to a, a series against the number one seed in the Eastern Conference, whoever that turns out to be. We've got one more thing to predict before we go. Almost forgot. It's expected, at least, that Joe Biden will make his vice presidential announcement sometime next week. Maybe before we tape the show, maybe after. But we're going to take our chances, and we're going to make that call right here, right now. Dave, we graded some choices a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. We kind of said who we thought Biden should pick. But now let's talk about who we think he will pick. What do you say? Well, he's up by probably eight to 10 points right now. And I think he's probably feeling pretty confident about where he is. And um, my guess is that he probably wants to pick that individual who he thinks has the most legitimate shot at becoming president if he were to falter. And I think that that individual, uh, not that she's of my political persuasion, as I mentioned a couple of shows ago, is Elizabeth Warren. And uh, I think that that will be 
his choice. So it, it definitely is a little bit of a long shot given the final group of candidates uh, for or, or uh, prospects for for the position. But I think Biden Warren will be uh, the ticket for the Democrats. Okay. Well, I'm going to do the same thing. I, as we were grading them out last time, I said I thought that Susan Rice would be the best choice for him. And I actually think he's going to pick her. He's one of those people that seems to like loyalty, seems to have people that he trusts, likes to have those around him. And so I think she's the kind of person he's got a good working relationship with from the Obama administration. So we'll see, but that's my well, prediction. I, I, that's a good choice. I actually, I, if, it, if it were not for Warren, I would probably say Rice. And you've seen the president, um, President Obama more involved in the Biden campaign recently. So if that is leading us on to think that it may be a Obama loyalist, then, then Rice definitely would, would be that person. So really interesting. I, I think we're going to see here uh, coming up soon. That's it for this week. So thanks very much for listening. As always, grateful for your support. Please remember to subscribe and to review the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And we look forward to talking to you next week. 